or get that speck out of his eye. It's not good. It's not good when you, you, you all of us have had something in our eye, I'm sure, sometime before. And you know how it feels. And you know how destructive it can be. And so we're supposed to just ignore it. Well, you know, and um, there is a case that we don't want to go around nitpicking every little thing, but there's a place for, uh, you know, the man of God especially. Um, and um, your friend, you know, we used to have a saying, it used to be widespread a lot, said friends don't let friends drive drunk. Well, you know, friends don't let a, shouldn't let a speck remain in the brother's eye if it's uh, going to cause them harm. They should at least mention it and then try to help them to get it out if they can. Now, you know, if they refuse your help, that's another matter. But then uh, uh, Max Lucado writes his little session here and at the end of it, and he does every chapter, I guess. Uh, it says, hmm. And, and here's the point, when you judge them, you're really judging yourself guilty when you judge someone else. Because you do the same things they do, Romans 2.1. Well, and that is the point, see, that, they seem to miss that a lot. Uh, that is the point, that um, uh, you are guilty of the same thing, then you don't have any business trying to judge your brother. But um, at, at uh, the other end of that is, like I say, once you get that log out of your own eye, or if you're clear to, then you need to help your brother get the speck out of their eye. That's not mean-spirited. I mean, you can be mean-spirited about it, but that's in itself is not mean-spirited. Um, and here it says, the Bible speaks about sin, how we miss the mark of God and His holy nature, of course. We see the devastating effects of sin all around us every day, it is our job to hate the sin, but it is God's job to deal with the sinner. Well, that, that is true, but sometimes we still need to address it. That's what the man of God is for. That's why we have evangelists. That's why we have pastors and teachers and preachers. Uh, Jeremiah said, you know, that uh, if the prophets in his day, the God said that through Jeremiah, if they had those prophets had prophesied the word of God, then they would have turned his people from their sin. And that's the purpose of when you have to judge someone, and everybody judges. Uh, like I say, that's, and they make a good point of that in here, um, that uh, you know, certain circumstances call you know, your judgment. In my case, if you're going to hire a babysitter to watch your children, you're certainly going to you know, judge whether they're fit to do that or not. Uh, if you're not, you're not much of a parent. And so, first of all, like I say, when it comes to judgment, yes, there is a, a place that the Scripture does not say not to do it entirely, but to do the same judgment as we would want done with us and, and the same judgment that we would use in that case. And I think that's where I've got to here. Um... Did Jesus live in poverty? I think I read some of that. Yeah, I did. Let me go on just a little bit further. Yeah, here's some things that, uh, some words that were, I just don't understand why they didn't use something, uh, a wording a little bit different. This, But then again, like I say, their purpose is to actually, they're not going to say that and put it that way, but it's actually their purpose is to water down the Word of God. When you do that, you try to make it more pleasing to man, more acceptable to the world. The Bible says there's power in God's Word. And when we water it down or weaken it to try to make it, you know, a little better for people to swallow, um, Jesus didn't do that when He said, well, except you... Eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. <laughs> you remember a bunch of his disciples that had been following him left him. Yeah, that's going to happen. But sometimes that's what has to be done. Because those who were unsincere, not really dedicated, left. But here, 
I think the purpose of this movement is to try to get those people to come back. And then you have a, what you're going to have then is a church that will not endure sound doctrine. A church full of believers or, or unbelievers even that will not endure sound doctrine. Now here's what it says about Jesus. This is Max Lucado's writing here. Uh, I, you know, I'm just pointing it out. There's ordinary man, ordinary place, but a conduit of extraordinary grace. Oh my goodness. Jesus is a conduit. That means that he has nothing of his own. It just flows through him, the Father. The Bible is clear that Jesus is God in the flesh. He came in the flesh as God. He said, you know, you've seen the Father, you've seen, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Um, this sounds so New Age-like. He's just, he's a conduit. Now that, you know, if you read the whole book, yes, it doesn't stop there, but just to put that in, that wording is just, I, I don't understand it. Um, it says, goes on, and in God's story, ordinary matters. Jesus was an ordinary baby. Now it makes the point and clarifies it, but I, there is nothing in the story to imply that he levitated over the manger or walked out of the stable. Just the opposite. He dwelt among us, John says. So, um, <laughs> he made a, of course, he didn't do that. But does that make him just an ordinary baby? I, I beg to differ. Um, and and he goes on just a few paragraphs later and, and does really do a good job of it, uh, explaining the deep things then. And he says, and I'll read that too, it says, all things, he quotes 1 Corinthians 8, 6, all things were made through him, not by him, but through him. Ooh, that's a different translation there. NCV, NCV, new something. Hmm. No wonder he said, ooh, that's worse than I thought. No wonder they say that Jesus was a conduit of extraordinary grace. The baby was born, but the word never was. Now, you know, it does give Jesus credit for being eternal, but all things were made through him, uh, nor by him, but not by him, but through him. This is what I'm reading here. Jesus didn't fashion the world out of raw material he found. He created all things out of nothing, true. He struggled just as we do. Oh my goodness. He experienced the same physical hardships of hunger, pain, true, and exhaustion. And I'm going to I think as far as I got. Uh, and and I will you know do one or two more segments on this at least. Uh, he understands our struggle. This is Max Lucado's closing statement here in this chapter. He understands our struggles because of his own struggles. Which would imply that if Jesus had never come to the earth, then he, he, God didn't have a clue about our struggles. Is that how many of you would take it? He understands our struggles because of his own struggles. I beg to differ. But... That is what this movement is about. That's what this book is about. And um, I sort of intentionally sit down here. I happen to be in the restroom here. I'm not urging anybody to do this, but right here is where this book, in my opinion, belongs. Uh, and that's not where it's going. Um, but pardon me. Um, 
bluntness there, but that's that's all it's good for, if you ask me. Yet, you know, um, that's terrible. And there's more there, and we'll do some more of it. And like I say, there are some good things in it. I, I'm very disappointed uh, with the the writers and the, the all of them, uh, and the people that's involved with this movement. Uh, certainly should know better, but um, it reveals a, you know something about them. So that's all I've got for today. Well, uh, I'm, I haven't finished reading it yet. I'll read more, and uh, I, you know, if the rest of it's great, then I'll that's what I'll show you. Dale Little here with Rescue American Ministries.